Have a look at this photograph. Have you seen this place before? Does this look familiar to you? That's right, you recognize it from the Blues Brothers movie or the first season of the TV show Prison Break. And despite it being an iconic backdrop, this prison was, in reality, a complete house of horrors, where over a thousand prisoners were packed in and subject to some of the cruelest treatment the American prison population has ever faced. Today we discover the Joliet Correctional Center, also known as the Old Joliet Jail. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The Old Joliet Jail was designed by William Boyington, an architect who also designed other local buildings, including the Chicago Water Tower and the Joliet Central High School. As I'm sure you've noticed, they share similarities in their design, including materials built with locally sourced limestone. Over a century, the old Joliet Correctional Center had a reputation for cruelty, and from the beginning, public perception was filled with ethical concerns. The Joliet Prison was built in 1858 to replace the Alton Prison, the first state penitentiary in the area. The Alton Prison was decaying and overcrowded, hence the living conditions were described back then as harsh and disease spread quickly. After failing the 1847 inspections, the Illinois General Assembly was forced to construct a new prison to replace it. Although there was already a surplus of prisoners, which meant free labor, construction of the prison did not begin until May the 22nd, 1858, when 53 prisoners from Alton were brought to the space that would later become Joliet Correctional Center. These prisoners were tasked with building the many buildings that surround the small original structure, and together as a complex, this would constitute the infamous penitentiary. Continued overcrowding and the consequences of the Civil War caused the Alton facility to be converted into a military prison. Over 11,000 Confederates were imprisoned at Alton and made up the majority of inmates. However, Union citizens who committed treason were also held at that location. Considering this military influx, Joliet's regular prison population grew to unsustainable levels. Even so, during and following construction, the prison received praise from the media. For example, the Chicago Tribune told their readers that prisoners were in a secure place and that the people of Joliet should be proud of their penitentiary. Unfortunately for that 1858 reporter, the public perception of the Joliet Correctional Center quickly soured. By 1878, the population was already overcrowded, nearly reaching 2,000 inmates, and in the coming years, the public became aware of the prison's unsanitary conditions. Things got so bad that in 1905, many called for the jail to be closed entirely. Former inmate William Cuthbert exposed the cruel treatment he and other prisoners received to the public through court testimony. While well in court, his discussion over cruel treatment brought constitutional arguments about the right of an incarcerated person into question. You see, the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution forbids a man from facing cruel and unusual punishment. But Cuthbert's case questioned whether an incarcerated man has the same constitutional rights as a free man. While prisoner rights were discussed during the trial, Cuthbert's testimony also exposed the cruel treatment that incarcerated people face on the inside detailing the cruelty of neglect and injuries he faced from guards. For example, while working on tasks pushing stones, he injured his hands so badly that he was entirely unable to move three of his fingers. The prison guards told him to keep working, and he was unable to receive any medical attention. The doctor who treated him, while temporarily out of the facility, shared that his condition was concerning because he had not received adequate care. In addition to the blatant abuse of prisoners, the inmates' diets were absolutely disgusting. As reported in the Herald News on May the 4th, 1905, their dinners consisted of a sour sauce that would later be recycled into pies. Their largest meals appeared to be lunch, including pork, boiled beans, and water. While many regard modern prison food as disgusting, the diets of Joliet inmates were exceptionally inhumane. In response to this unbecoming media attention, many once again called for the prison to be closed. Well, Joliet did not shut down. Another nearby prison was built fully to rehouse these inmates. 
The Statesville Penitentiary was built in 1925 and could incarcerate 4,000 prisoners at a time. Unlike Joliet, Statesville remains open to this day. As a part of the Illinois Department of Corrections, while there were frequent attempts to close the prison during the 20th century, Joliet Correctional Center also participated in external programs within the Chicago area. However, these programs were also not without controversy. You see, after the unethical experiments at the Willowbrook State School were shut down, the so-called volunteers, most of whom were actually Vietnam draft dodgers incarcerated at Joliet, were forced to participate in hepatitis experiments for the United States Army in the 1960s. And as you might imagine, the Joliet prison was the perfect breeding ground for hepatitis studies because of the extreme overcrowding and unsanitary conditions. And as bad as that all sounds, believe it or not, things were about to get a lot worse. In 1975, Joliet faced a hostage situation with members of multiple Chicago gangs who expressed anger over being transferred to other prisons. Oddly, the other prisoners that were held hostage were reassured that they would not be harmed, but a former gang member attempting to reconcile with their former associates was murdered. The murder of Hubert Cadillac Cathlett ended the rebellion, and the prison warden memorialized him during his funeral. Although the 1905 attempts to shut down Joliet failed, activists continued to push for its closure. It wouldn't be until 1972 when a bipartisan congressional subcommittee visited the prison and demanded its closure. Representative Thomas Railsback was quoted in the Chicago Tribune as saying that the prison has a medieval atmosphere about it. Although all four members were disgusted by the prison conditions, the sole Democrat member, Abner Migva, claimed they were not out of the ordinary for incarceration contending that the most significant issue plaguing Joliet was overcrowding, and hence the committee's goal was to facilitate the creation of more prisons with populations under 300. The subcommittee also noted that there were problems with the parole system within Joliet, as inmates were only given five minutes to speak with the parole board, making it exceedingly difficult to plead their cases. While this investigation highlighted the much needed reforms towards the old prison facility, it ultimately focused on Joliet in general. Rather than fixing the individual concerns of this single person's complaint, ultimately only recommendations were given on how to proceed. And because of this weak authority, Joliet was not affected by the 1972 subcommittee and remained open for another 30 years. By the 1990s, the city of Joliet was really struggling with its reputation. Not only did the public have a negative opinion of the penitentiary, but the city itself was considered an eyesore. But the city's answer to this criticism was unique, as rather than attempting to erase its past, it embraced its history. Joliet also enhanced its strong points. For example, working with the Will County Forest Preserve and Core Lands, the city focused on acquiring aesthetically pleasing attractions for the town. This was a new project for the group, whose previous work utilized new land rather than renovation. Anyhow, for the first time, they were working with a historic site. There were also plans to create a museum within the Correctional Center dedicated to the history of Illinois prisons. Unfortunately, the Joliet Correctional Center would be abandoned just 12 years later. Joliet Correctional Center was closed in February of 2002. Illinois Governor George Ryan cited budgetary reasons, claiming that the closure of Joliet would save $4 million annually. Despite this, there were plans to build another giant prison immediately after the shutdown. This would be a maximum security prison. The closing of Joliet Correctional Center mirrored the past. The remaining prisoners and the employees were shipped over to the nearby Statesville prison, which was actually the plan 80 years before when Statesville was initially opened. While reporting the closure of Joliet, the Chicago Tribune highlighted how Joliet Correctional Center had been considered an outdated disciplinary system since the 1920s. While most people were pleased that Joliet was finally closing, members of the prison guard union opposed the measure. They were concerned that inmates would target security guards during transportation to Statesville. 
Regardless, the shutdown of Joliet did not lose any jobs. While most employees moved to Statesville with the prisoners, some guards remained in the otherwise abandoned Joliet to sort out administrative work. Regardless, the budget cut did not sacrifice any employment. While the complex was abandoned at this point, the story of Joliet Correctional Center didn't end in 2002. The old Joliet Correctional Center became a pop culture icon and this rejuvenated public interest in the penitentiary. Although the prison's most famous appearance in media was in the first season of the Fox television show Prison Break, the old Joliet Correctional Center had been featured in over 20 films and television shows. They span from as early as 1942, with exteriors being used in white heat. It was also used as recently as the 10th episode of Destination Fear in 2020. The penitentiary has gotten as much media coverage and appearance in the 21 years since its closure as during its 144 years of operation. In addition to film and television, the old Joliet prison has frequently been referenced in music and literature. For example, Percy's song by Bob Dylan is about someone trying to commute their friend's sentence at the Joliet facility. This center also hosted some very famous criminals, such as the notorious degenerate John Wayne Gacy, who was briefly held there before being transferred to Statesville, where he was ultimately executed. These days, visitors can actually tour the Joliet prison almost daily. The tours reference the many films the prison was featured in, such as the Blues Brothers, while also encapsulating the rich and gruesome history of the prison. But if you can't stop by for a tour, don't worry, I'll tell you what lays within this mysterious prison. As you enter the prison grounds, you'll be greeted by the imposing walls of the main cell block, which stretches four stories high and runs the length of the prison. Once inside, you'll be struck by the eerie quiet of the abandoned cell blocks, which were once filled with thousands of inmates. As you make your way through the corridors, you'll see the tiny cells that once held prisoners for up to 23 hours a day. You also have the cafeteria, recreation yard, and other areas where inmates spent their time. The prison also features an impressive chapel built by the inmates and remains a testament to their faith and creativity. As you may recall from the show Prison Break, the old Joliet prison is also known for its intricate network of tunnels that run beneath the facility. These tunnels were originally built to transport supplies and goods between different areas of the prison, but they also played a significant role in its history. According to some sources, in the 1920s Prohibition era, the tunnels were used to smuggle alcohol and contraband, then sold to inmates for a profit. Today, the tunnels are a very popular attraction for visitors to the prison. They are dimly lit and narrow, with low ceilings and damp walls. As you walk through the tunnels, you can see evidence of their former use, including old rail tracks and storage areas. Some of the tunnels have been closed off for safety reasons, but visitors can still explore a significant portion of this fascinating underground network. The tunnels offer a glimpse into the prison's past and provide a unique perspective of life behind bars in the early 20th century. But what about their use for escape? There is one story, but sources are sketchy at best and I could not verify this. So if there's an expert watching, please help us out in the comments. Anyways, the story goes. The escape took place on May the 22nd, 1945, and was orchestrated by a career criminal known as John Jack Cole. Cole and his accomplices spent months digging a tunnel that led from their cell in the prison basement to a spot outside the walls of the prison. They used tools they had smuggled in from the prison's black market, including spoons and a piece of metal from the bed frame. The tunnel was approximately 60 feet long and took the inmates to a nearby creek where they had a prearranged getaway car waiting for them. The escape plan almost fell apart when the inmates encountered a gas line that ran through the tunnel, which they had not anticipated. They managed to get around the line by digging a side tunnel, but this delay meant that they had less time to escape before the prison guards discovered they were missing. The escape was ultimately successful, and the six inmates were able to flee to different parts of the country. However, their freedom was short-lived, as all six were eventually caught and returned to prison. Cole, the mastermind behind the escape, 
was eventually released from prison in 1959, but he was rearrested in 1974 and ultimately died in prison in 1985. This escape remains one of the most daring and dramatic in the history of the Old Joliet prison. Another famous escape happened by notorious bank robber Babyface Nelson, who was incarcerated in the Old Joliet prison for a brief period, who made his escape during a transfer. Overall, perhaps the only safe conclusion is that the Old Joliet prison is a haunting reminder of the harsh realities of life behind bars in the early 20th century. While it's no longer a functioning penitentiary today, the Joliet Correctional Center is cemented in American history and stands as an odd relic of American pop culture. And with that said, I'd like to mention that there's one final jail in Chicago that I'm considering doing a video on, the Metropolitan Correctional Center, which is basically a skyscraper jail with a yard on top. So if you'd like to see that video, let me know by clicking subscribe, join, and thumbs up. Until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.